Good evening, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all tonight. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome each and every one of you, for those of you that don't know, to our traditional unceded territories of our Musqueam people, our Squamish, our tsleil for which we're all related, we're all family, and so the boundaries thin out and disappear when there's important things going on, as today. So I'm here on behalf of all of my three tribes, and I'd like to welcome you to our homeland. On behalf of my chief, Wayne Sparrow, who, yes, shares the last name as me, but he's my little brother, and I taught him everything he knows, that's why he's chief. <laughs> I don't know why I get a giggle out of that all the time. But, uh, you know, just like I always like to say in that movie called The Whale Rider, which is one of my favorite. She stands up and she says, I come from a long line of chiefs. I actually do. My grandfather, Edward Sparrow Shuanam, went to Supreme Court for us in our Shaughnessy case and helped to win that case based on who he was, not what someone else said he could or couldn't say. And for that, I, I always honor him. Because when he was leaving this world at 100, and I sat with him beside his bed in an August night, he said, he said, always remember what I told you, to know who you are and to know where you come from. And I said, I will, for sure I will. Because he said, if you don't know that, they'll get you. And I understand what he means by that. I had the wonderful opportunity today of spending four hours with 60 teenagers. Uh, 30 in the morning, 30 in the afternoon. And my sister and I, Robin, talked about our responsibility as weavers and as creators of beautiful things that represent our people and our history. And we have to come along the subject of anthropology and what it means to our people. And I shared with them that not many, a couple of years ago, we stood on our land out by the airport to protect our Cessnam village. And we have to constantly remind people that what they call a midden is not a midden, but it is our people's belongings. It is our history. And it is not anthropology. It is not what is defined by our English terms of who we are today. And so that we stand by that. And they're not objects. They're our personal belongings. Even our young ones today are not taught the same way some of us were. We're so fortunate, I'm fortunate to have known my grandfather and to hear him pass on to me the values and some of the laws of this land that we live in so beautifully for thousands of years. So there are many stories to tell, but most of them are tied to the values of who we are as Indigenous people, no matter where we come from and that we're out to set a new way of looking at who we are, especially with reconciliation. How do we reconcile? On a day today when it was called, how do we deal with discrimination and race? I shared with those youth today and I asked many questions that actually some of them couldn't answer and most of them couldn't. And the reason they couldn't was because we're so busy in our lives today we're forgetting to teach our youth how valuable they are and that we must share that again so that they can grow stronger and that they can stand and take their place and rise like our grandparents and great-grandparents and that we make that connection for them. And I'm sure that's the work you do in a different way as you move through your life and all of you in this room who are open to learning a new way with an old tradition. That's what we share. And so I hold my hands up to you for the work you do and your colleagues because it's important in museums and in studies that we redefine who we are as people and that we're not just in a museum. In fact, I might invite you all out to the Museum of Anthropology where our beautiful exhibit is on fabric of the land with our textiles that have come home to visit us for 
after 200 years, have come home. And so I'm there from 11 to 3 on Wednesdays and Fridays. I couldn't be there today because it was with my youth, but I'll be there Friday. And it's a real honor for me to stand and sit and be with my blankets that have come home and to reconnect them as I build a blanket right inside the museum. And it was quite hard for me to say yes because I have to get up on this little stage down there and sit there and weave and feel like I'm an Indian on display. But it's important too for me to be there to explain and to share what it is that we have as people of this land. And it has been wonderful. It's been wonderful talking to people and sharing with the children when they come in. And so we have the pros and cons of what museums are and what they mean to many people. So as I leave you tonight, um, I must leave you a little early. I have much work to do. Um, I would just like to share with you, not a prayer, but a nice little poem that many may have heard me say before. I was sharing with my friend. She said, oh, it's so nice to see you again. I said, I'll try not to repeat myself. Because we're called quite often now with protocol to come down and share and welcome each and every one of you to our beautiful land. What land of it we can see. It's getting kind of crowded in the city, isn't it? So I like to return to my land by the river, but sometimes when I want quiet, the airplanes are coming and going because they're right across from us. So it's hard to find a quiet place now in the city or in the surrounding of Vancouver, but being at the Museum of Anthropology is highly recommended. So as I leave you tonight, I will just share with you a beautiful little poem written by our wonderful late Chief Dan George. Um, beautiful words he left for us. May the stars carry your sadness away. May the flowers fill your heart with beauty. May hope forever wipe away your tears, but above all, may silence make you strong. Powerful words for a, an amazing person. So you all must be really strong in this room because you're all silent. So I wish you a good evening, good words, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bonjour, Annie. Welcome. Um, it is my great honor tonight to host this event and for the Indigenous Research Institute at SS SFU um, with our partners in the, f in the Faculty of Arts and Science. And it is my honor uh, to welcome Eldon as our host commentator uh, from the uh, Department of First Nation Studies and Archaeology and our honored guest, Dr. Audra Simpson, please. Good evening, and uh, welcome to the program this evening. And I'm, I'm just so uh, pleased to see so many people out here tonight. You know, uh, it's a great crowd, and it's a good, a good night to have a conversation with uh, Audra. <clears throat> uh, Audra and I are, uh, well, there was a time when we were young scholars. <laughs> we still are. <laughs> uh, but we were, we were both in grad school together at McGill. We were doing our uh, PhD programs at the same uh, time. And we even had the same uh, supervisor, uh, the late Dr. Bruce Trigger uh, was both our uh, supervisors and uh, somebody we both uh, respected and uh, really learned a lot from. Uh, and over the years, uh, well, I, I have to admit that we have tended to uh, let the distance uh, keep us from communicating, and so we haven't really seen each other since grad school days, you know. Uh, so this is going back, uh, well, it seems like a century ago. Wait a minute, it was last century. <laughs> it does seem that long ago, you know. I, mean, you know, I feel it in my bones every day, you know. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a real thrill to, to have uh, Audra coming in to visit our campus and uh, to, I don't think, this is the first time you visited SFU, isn't it? Second time. Second, when was yeah. the first time? 
I can't remember, like four years ago, oh, five okay. years ago, Glenn and I were on a panel together. Ah, mm -hmm. so you've had a, an opportunity before to, to see our Burnaby campus and... No, not Burnaby. Oh, first time uh, first shopper time. at Burnaby, <laughs> which was okay. quite oh, beautiful. Right <laughs> yeah, uh, sometimes I forget what a, what a large footprint uh, SFU has in mm -hmm. this city, but yeah, we do have locations all over the place. Uh, so what we are going to do this evening is to, to talk about, you know, Audra and I were both... Uh, studying anthropology, albeit uh, different aspects of uh, anthropology. I was in the archaeology uh, stream, and uh, Audra was more in the social and political uh, anthropology. Uh, but over the course of our student careers, you know, and there's no, no opportunity to, uh, you know, kind of dismiss each other. We, we see each other all the time, and, you know, we would often, uh, the grad student house at McGill called Thompson House, you know, uh, just a great place for everybody to congregate, and you know, we used to socialize there. Uh, but also, uh, Montreal is just such a happening city. There's always something to do. So uh, that's kind of my first, my first question is just to, to uh, Audra to uh, tell us about growing up near Montreal on, uh, at Ganawake, and what, what did that, uh, how did that influence your uh, older uh, career? Um. Well, I grew up partially, mostly in Brooklyn and also Ganawage. So I'm both, I'm a cross-border person, like many Mohawks, uh, many people from Ganawage. And that, um, so that's not exceptional, but it's very important to the project that I undertook. So the book that I wrote, some of you may have heard of it or uh, read parts of it or... It was an ethnography, right? So I'm very much an anthropologist <laughs> um, because I, um, I did engage, I did do the practice and methodology of, of deep hanging out, what Renato Rosaldo called deep hanging out. <laughs> I'm a, such a scientist. So, um, but I did it in multiple sites and for the anthropologists here, uh, and other social scientists, this is not unusual, right, uh, anymore, but at the time, in the uptight 90s, the thing called multi-sided research was bizarre. Uh, you wouldn't get funded by Winter Gren at the time if you said you were doing this, and, but yet our lives were multi-sided. So, um, and transnationalism was just starting to be a kind of analytic and a framework that people would use, but meanwhile, in my community, we have people, we have for the past century, and, and probably some change, we've had people working in New York City putting up high steel, you may know about this, the iron workers, that would live in New York for um, parts of Brooklyn in particular. And we have a part of Brooklyn called Little Ganawage uh, on Atlantic Avenue that was called Little Ganawage, now people live in Bay Ridge more, and would return, take the drive back to Ganawage on Friday nights and spend the weekend home sleeping and recovering from the hard week of work and then go back to Brooklyn. So my family, my parents, uh, my father was a window cleaner, so he worked all the time and we lived mostly in Brooklyn. Now, when I was 18, I couldn't get out of there fast enough and I went back home. And I had been going home my whole life, right? And this is also the thing, I don't know if you have, a, there are other people in the audience like this where the separation between reserve and home is not that you're always going home whenever chance you get, and that was my life. So, um, so when I finally did move back, like permanently, I was there, I was there, I was there, and then, then I was in Montreal, because I couldn't drive, because I partially grew up in Brooklyn. So I went to Montreal, I moved to Montreal to be in school, and um, so it was always this like kind of moving around, but that was my central place. Now the key is my central, political place, my central analytic place, the people that I love the most were and are there. So when it came time to do my work, to do my research, I knew it had to be about home, but I needed to find a discipline. And this is gonna sound so uh, you know, weird to some people who have these very sharpened critiques of anthropology, you know, anthropology was no friend to Indians for, especially mine, uh, you know, uh, so, I'm, so I, um, I, I didn't have anywhere to go. Like, I, it was like either anthro, because there was no, nobody was doing native literature at that time. I feel, now maybe we are old, Eldon. I was like really <laughs> feeling distant from you when you were talking about us being old. 
you know? I was like, speak for yourself, right? But, but now I'm thinking back and I'm like, wow, the 90s, you know, this was the 90s. And I remember I was like, I wanted to be as close to Gonawage as possible uh, with the possibility of being able to live there and commute if I needed to. So it was like Concordia or McGill. And McGill, um, we were advised by our advisor, uh, post-secondary advisor, Indians don't go to McGill. They, we go to Concordia. So that's why it was just Eldon and I, you know, we were like the two red spots in that department. And he, you're the trailblazer, right? You were the first PhD, I think first Indian PhD in that department student. And then I was the second. And, um, but either way, that's just to say, so I was looking for a discipline and the only discipline that dealt with indigenous peoples was anthropology. But then the way the field was dealing with us was kind of hard, you know, like <laughs> we weren't being taught Julie Cruikshank's work at that level. We weren't, you know, so I was having to slog through this older stuff, but, um, but I did get taught this article by, uh, I think it's Archie Mafiji on like colonialism in Africa. And I read this article and I said, this is what it is. And he was an African anthropologist that was like going after the framework right, and going after the discipline, but also doing this critical work. And then I thought, if, if he can do that, then maybe I can do something. And so I stuck with anthropology, for better or for worse, I'm glad I did now. Now I feel very positive towards the field, but let me tell you, there were times when I did not. Um, but I worked through that in the, in the research and in the dissertation. And then the book, and then subsequently, so. Yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> Like the League of the Haudenosaunee, that's like one of the foundational uh, volumes in American anthropology. Yes. Written by none other than Lewis Henry Morgan. You know, and, uh, Lewis Henry Morgan had a very specific perspective. But then by the time uh, the 1990s rolled around, rolled around and we were in grad school, self-reflexive anthropology mm -hmm. had become kind of the paradigm uh, at that time. So how did you find, like, did you go back to those classics, like Lewis Henry Morgan's work, and, and critique them, and, and to uh, look at them in terms of yourself uh, as a Mohawk woman. I, I, it's so funny when you ask that, because I'm so uncomfortable talking about, it's, I don't know if it's, I'm alone with this, but I get uncomfortable when people ask me to speak for women <laughs> or anything like that, but I'll say this, uh, I read that book, I, I'm supposed to put it back into print actually, because it's out of print, um, but when I first read the book, what, the one thing I found the most remarkable about it initially was he inscribed it to Ely S. Parker, and he called the book The Product of Our Joint Researches. So that set me on another six-month research journey, writing letters, because then you wrote letters, to the American Philosophical Society to get whatever documents they had from Ely S. Parker. Elias Parker is, was a condoled chief of the, of the Seneca Nation, and um, he did the field work that produced League of the Haudenosaunee. And I was working with, very closely with Bruce Trigger at the time, and I said, Bruce, I think Ely, this is Ely's document. I don't know that this is Lewis Henry Morgan's document. And all I could find was eight pages that was Ely's. So I can't say, so that to me was the most remarkable thing. Now, when you go to that document, uh, you go to that book, it is the, one of the par paradigmatic texts of political anthropology. It actually gives this model of our, our governance system, the, the system of 50 chiefs. Um, it's, to me, it, it is an important um, anthropological text, but it's also one that I really had to wrestle with because it sets up a model of our culture and our governance structure that has become, became hegemonic. And it was something called the uh, Handsome Lake Code in some ways that also became hegemonic. And when I looked to Ganawage and I went through this literature, all of this literature, Ganawage was always on the outside. They were always suggesting, and even some of these people were Haudenosaunee anthropologists um, and linguists, were suggesting that we did not know our culture. And that really irritated me because in my community, 10% of us speak Mohawk. That's actually very good. We speak the most language of any of the Confederacy people. 
but yet we were, they kept, they kept bringing up in the literature these mixed blood Mohawks. And you know what, I felt like saying, you need to step off. We've been taking captives for 300 years and making them Indians, <laughs> right? We've been holding it down over there. We're, we're the keepers of the Eastern door. You know what, that door's busy. There's a lot of people moving through that door. And the Oka crisis, really, a so-called crisis, right? That, gal that galvanized, the rest of the world kind of said, oh, well, look at them, right? We're not gonna let people come into our door still, right? So I was, I, when I read this anthropological literature that made us seem like we were culturally impure, racially deficient, uh, un I was furious. <laughs> So, because the people I kind of like, my family, like we're workers, we're like holding it down, we're, um, you know, doing all this work to, to survive, and, it, and that wasn't in that literature. What there was was judgment. So I had a, a, a big machete in my left hand, and I sort of read with the machete, and, I, and that is a chapter in the book, and it's on this sort of fetishization, what I call a fetishization of uh, tradition and culture. And now this is not to say that our traditions don't matter to us, that we don't have long houses in the plural back home, um, but it's, it really bothered me that these people would talk about us this way when we were doing all this hard work and also in, given such an impossible situation to work with, all of this land loss. So, um, so what I did was I critiqued while at the same time um, trying to open up a space for the kind of ethnography that would allow people to understand what we were dealing with, which was profound land loss, a colonial inheritance in law that our women were unfairly burdened with, right, by being pushed out through the Indian Act, and this so-called problem of membership. But I had to understand the literature that was used to understand us, in order, I thought, for us to have a kind of representational freedom. Now, I'm not saying, we're already free, but I wanted to, in terms of a literature, create a, a, a bigger space for us to be understood. And I also wanted to do a kind of work on anthropology that I thought was really necessary because the relations between Haudenosaunee and anthropology were so bad that we were not allowing anthropologists in all of the territories because uh, William Fenton betrayed elders he, he promised he'd never, uh, he, when he was out at Seneca, because of course he was out at Seneca, because that's where the supposedly pure Haudenosaunee are, they let him, uh, you know, study the masks, our Hadoui masks, and he promised he would, well, you're not supposed to show images of these masks, because they're live, right? They need to be fed and cared for. As soon as those elders died, he published his book on false face masks. So, that and other issues with anthropologists also denying our claim, I, I don't even like using the language of claim, but our, um, our truth that we uh, influence the US Constitution, right, through our democratic system. Benjamin Franklin saw our chiefs and council and copied us. It's a joke, but not, he did. <laughs> well, then these anthropologists went and told New York State that we didn't know our history and that this didn't happen. So the Haudenosaunee people across the board said no more anthropology in our territories. And, I, and then on top of that, I had my own issues with the way my own community was being represented. Because then other Haudenosaunee people, you know, start to think this about us too. And I was like, we're not gonna have this anymore. You know, we're anti-colonialism, because to me we're pretty, pretty steadfast consistent anti-colonialists. <laughs> I mean, we don't use that language, but we're always for our territory and our people and protecting our people. Um, and, and, and it was being mis, I think, um, it inferred as something else. Even like, you know, Larry Hopman, these historians will say, oh, they don't know what they're doing over there. They're just these radicals. Like, as if that's a bad thing. But, <laughs> you know, but this is the way we were being understood. And then, of course, there's Quebec and the way Quebec, their particular uh, feelings towards us, right, which were very apparent during the Oka crisis. So that's why the, 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 where the work comes from. 
Sure, you know, and, and of course, uh, Lewis Henry Morgan's uh, book on uh, you know setting up that scheme of savagery, barbarism, yes. and civilization. We were the coming. barbarians. Yeah, yeah. And but it, he also used that volume as a way to justify uh, Americans' uh, manifest destiny to make it mm. seem normal that they should be the ones on top and these barbaric and savage races right. uh, to be left behind. Uh, but also at the same time, you know. Uh, Ganawaki is kind of famous. The one famous citizen, Katarai Takakweta, uh, was canonized uh, by the Catholic Church mm -hmm. not too long ago. How, what is the feeling about that? In, in knowing the history with the Catholic Church and mm -hmm. Native people, how, how was that uh, received today? Well, I think there's some amount of pride for it. I mean, you know, there's uh, Tekakwita. She's a saint. I think we're all saintly, but she's in the big house <laughs> of the saints. Good for her. You know, I, I have to say, I mean, I know we're being recorded, but like, I'm not a longhouse person. I support them. I, I thank God they do what they do. And, but I pray to Cattery every night. You know, I don't know. I don't know. I'm a confirmed Catholic. I'm a bad Catholic. I'll probably be a bad Catholic later this evening. Um, but I, I um, you know, I'm proud of her, just like I'm proud of uh, my cousin who played for the NHL, Bobby Simpson. Uh, the Mohawk girls on TV, you know, these are we're big time people, right? And um, now we we do, I think some of us are steadfast longhouse followers and they follow follow the old so-called old religion and um, you know, they might tell you something different about her. I have never heard her called a traitor or treachery or any of this business. Um, I respect her for her discipline, you know, to do what she did. It's impressive and interesting. There's now literature. Um, Vera Palmer has written on uh, Gadari. Like, there's people are trying to reinterpret her life outside of mission. You know, because they used to say we were mission Indians. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, like that's the northern part of our territory, right? It made sense that we would be up there. So there's a whole lot of revisionary geographic and political work that needs to be done. And I think her life will be imagined differently when we also analytically remove her a bit more from the church. But indeed, she's saintly and good for her. I hope to join her. Not tonight. We all do. I'll see you up there, Eldon. Because the alternative is not so good. I know. Well, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, Thompson Highway writes about hell nicely, though. I like that, the way he writes about it. I'm like, that's where the party is. Uh, yeah. uh, so one of your one of your main interventions in doing your in that work your work with uh, Mohawk Interrupt us uh, is the concept of refusal of mm -hmm. refusing the gifts of liberal democracy mm -hmm. uh, one being citizenship mm -hmm. and I, I can't help but say this you know is this a, a situation of uh, Canadian if necessary but not necessarily Canadian What do you mean No I don't know Like you know when you have a passport that is a Canadian passport or if, uh, you have a status card you know uh, and use these uh, symbols of Canadian citizenship uh, when they're necessary, but when they're not, uh, the other identity uh, emerges or... No, I have a much deeper understanding of that, so I should probably unpack that for you. Yeah. Um, refusal is um, a th both a theory and a practice, and it emerges, my understanding of it emerges from the history of Haudenosaunee people who politically refuse to be anything other than Haudenosaunee. So although some of us may have status cards in our purses or our handbags, it is uh, we do not vote in elections because it's a foreign government. Um, we try really hard not to pay taxes. We've gone to jail for refusing. Um, I once saw a man um, who went, presented with symptoms of having a heart attack and when asked to show his Medicare card said, I am not subject to you and walked out and he just died recently, but that's 20 years later. So I mean, it's a, it's a practice of, I think it's not just like convenience, it's actually quite inconvenient. So um, it's a long game. It, um, I think it's different than resistance. It's a long game that is suited to the situation of occupation that we live under. So it produces, it, to me it's a generative practice that produces goods in a utilitarian sense almost. Uh, it produces a sense of dignity and obligation to your own people. And um, yeah, so no, I don't think it's about convenience. In fact, I think it's often about inconvenience. 
And um, I also, in the book, taking from the ways in which I was thinking about it and documenting with uh, Haudenosaunee political practices, I also used refusal at the level of the text. So if you remember from the book, there's stuff that I just don't write in. And um, part of this is a pushback on the so socio and scientific expectation of replicable results. I don't think everything is people's business. I think in vulnerable communities, which we, although we may be tough, all of us, we are still vulnerable. This is, this is a white supremacist state, whether we like it or not, right? At times, it's, we're really starting to see this in the states again. Um, there's stuff they don't need to know. And I think um, I made that decision at the level of the ethnography to not repeat certain things because I was dealing with issues of membership. I was dealing with um, the difficult deliberations we were having over that. And uh, they hate us in Quebec. And I did not want to give them anything more. Well, that was actually going to be my next question. You know, uh, can you say a bit more about this project and its implications for political anthropology, for studies of gender and settler colonialism? Uh, because, of course, uh, not only do you have to deal with the Canadian reality, but then lacquered onto that is the Quebecois uh, reality. Mm -hmm. and, and Quebecois, uh, oftentimes, their aspirations mirror those of your community, and yet they're willing to trample on your rights in order to advance theirs. Uh, how is this uh, dynamic playing out today? Oh, I don't know how it's playing out today so much, but I know historically, I mean, we are literally two nations, you know, whatever, how many nations in Quebec, but we are the English-speaking uh, Indian nation. So, and we will keep speaking English, right, and keep speaking Mohawk. Some of us now are, I have a little cousin that's in French, which is so interesting, because that would have never happened at one time. Um, but... Um, uh, that just to say that I think um, the study itself pays attention and uses also the analytic of settler colonialism. Now, the settler colonialism is helpful, I think, in Canada and the United States because we have not, it's, this is an enduring structure. They never left. So to talk about post-colonialism is to talk about places where they left and where you have a full kind of sovereignty. Um, we have strangulated forms of sovereignty. What we have now also are attempts, I think, to ameliorate whatever claims we're making, both in the courts and beyond, through this, uh, the, the magic wand of reconciliation, which is supposed to smooth everything over through affective and therapeutic models of governance. Um, I I think it's dangerous, actually. Um, so, and that comes, I trace it in this new book that I'm doing, I trace this history, I'm doing an emotional history of the state, and I think they started this business after Oka, because they saw what happened as, uh, with Oka as being too dangerous. So within three months, you have um, uh, Phil Fontaine confess, you, after Oka, which was you know armed resistance, classic, I mean, just like impossible to ignore or, or to, to not be affected by, I think deeply affected by. Within three months, you have Phil Fontaine's confessional. And I'm calling it a confessional, even though he was so careful and refused to give the contents of his sexual abuse. He did this to Barbara Frum. And Barbara Frum was pushing him and pushing him, saying, what happened to you uh, in those schools? And he said, I don't know, but I think maybe all of the boys were abused. And that launches, I think, the, the new period that we're in, which is, I mean, it doesn't become, it's not, you have the, the non-apology apology, but um, you know, this, is, this is what we're in now. So I think it's an emotional period that is you know, less interested, I think, in um, really dealing with us directly and is trying to smooth through this, you know, taking both uh, resources, stories, experiences, et cetera. So Quebec I can't speak to uh, with very much intelligence because I don't follow them perhaps as I should. But um, you know they have their aspirations as well. I'm very happy to say that I don't think they can really legitimately make any claims until they deal with us. So 
I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, and, and let me just ask you, the time is running out for them too, because you know, all the discourse that we talk about, it's all predicated on that historical narrative of the white man and the Indians. But we're coming to the end of that period, you know, uh, and it's mostly, uh, most noticeable in Quebec because not only are they, mm. uh, the anxiety of, of uh, no longer having a white majority in uh, Quebecers, mm -hmm. but they're a linguistic minority in mm. North America. Well, French is a small language mm. in, in North America, so they have that. So what do you think about in the future? Like when there's no more white majority, what will be the... Uh, Light motif for native people uh, at that time. The, what does light motif mean? It's kind of the zeitgeist. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> uh, like our. What will motivate them? What will, what will motivate us? Yeah. It's always going to be justice. Until we get our land back, until we get, uh, you know, we're treated with respect and honor and dignity, it's always going to be justice. Um, if, we, if the wonderful, you know, terrifying hordes of color that have got Donald Trump losing his mind um, are going to swallow the white majority, it would be lovely if, like, we did this together and in relation to each other and we were good relations with each other. So, you know, I used to imagine that our, we'd get our lands restored, our governance systems would be up and running, and they would carry our passports. That was my, like, imagined space. We'd all, I was drinking martinis then. <laughs> I thought we'd all have martinis together. You know, but I, I mean, those, those are some weird utopic uh, ideas, but uh, now I really don't know even if the model of the nation state is something that we should aspire to, and if we, if we can allow ourselves, and I don't allow myself to do this very often because I'm such a, I'm a critic and I, you know, I do nuts and bolts stuff and I'm trying to always demystify kind of the ways in which knowledge are produced and make associations to get a story out. But, so I don't tend to think too far into the future, although I think our people are all the time. That's why we're always standing up and being in the way. But um, now, if I allow myself the, the luxury of imagining, it would be that we would try to be good relations to each other, good relatives to each other. That's work on our end, and that's work for them. They have to know the so-called hordes, whoever they are. I don't know who they are. I, did, I don't know. But they have to know of where they're coming to. Right? So we can't entrust that to states. But at the same time, that's a huge, like, how much teaching can we do? FYI, you're on Indian land. Do you know what this is like in New York City? Everybody thinks they're an Indian, right, in the states. This is exhausting, right? Because <laughs> then you're like, oh, really, you are. Are you? How did that happen? You know, like, it's just like this American thing, right? So oh, I, I see the commercial for 23 and Me. <laughs> right, right, exactly. That insidious, like, bloodist, whatever that is. Uh, right, exactly. So, so there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff that we have to do, but with friends. I really am starting to realize that we need our accomplices. Like, we need them. They need us. We need them. Let's get it, let's get it started. You know, when I, when I was back in, the, back in the Paleolithic, when I was an undergrad, <laughs> uh, one of the people Very I funny, Eldon. <laughs> Archie <archaeology> humor. <laughs> one, of, one of the people that was very influential for me was uh, Alvin Toffler. He was a, a futurist, and he made this famous statement, you know, talking about it in 1970, mm. his book, uh, The Third Wave, and he said, the present is white, the future is going to be technicolor. And I think we're at that technicolor stage now, or coming closer to it than he imagined it. Uh, but you know, I want to I want to uh, divert from our current conversation now, and I want to kind of focus more on your your career as uh, an anthropologist. You know, the study of the human condition, and the fact that there have been very few indigenous women who have taken on this career uh, in anthropology, and and because they're you know like. Few precedents for you to to find. Who were your guiding lights in uh, this discipline? Um, it's such an embarrassing question because I don't think I'm very important. So it's like, <laughs> why would you want to know who I thought was cool or whatever? But all right, let's. I'll go to. I'll go there with you. Um, so when I was uh, grow, uh, coming of age in McGill, uh, you know that was a particular space. 
we won't talk about it, but openly, but there weren't a lot of like female role models there. So I was really uh, quite taken by this wonderful Anishinaabe cultural studies scholar at Concordia. Some of you may have known her, Gail Guthrie Valaskakis. She uh, was awesome. She was from Lac de Flambeau. She was the Dean of Arts and she had a PhD from McGill, but she first went to Con uh, Cornell and she wound up at Concordia and she did so much for us there. And, but what the thing was like, she was a cultural studies person, which there are still no Indians in cultural studies really for whatever reasons, but she wrote these fabulous essays about home that were both inflected with her memories, with materiality, with a critique of museums, with a celebration of museums, with, um, so I just loved her intellectually, but also she was just so, such an awesome human being. She used to take me to lunch, and it was kind of like she was my intellectual mom. And um, of course I have my mom mom, who also is my mom mom, but she was like, she kind of looked after me, and she taught me how to be a mentor. So um, I quite loved her, and, uh, and then, um, I have a colleague, Elizabeth Pavanelli, who I just looked up to. I, so this is what happened. I, I managed to somehow get to a conference once. I had no money. I don't know how I got there. Anyway, I, pro I probably shouldn't remember how I got there, but I got there somehow, and I watched this panel. It was like on indigenous stuff, so I was like, I gotta go to this panel. And um, I was really earnest, and, and there was all these, all these people on the panel, and they kind of gave their papers, and they were boring. And then my co she's now my colleague. Beth was the, Beth Pavanelli was the uh, discussant, and she discussed these papers with such like brilliance that it was better than the papers. So I was like, I wanna be like her. Like it was a weird moment where I was like, that's a smart person, wow. So then, that's a really smart person, like an athletically smart person. And I, but I didn't really understand her. <laughs> So what I did was like I kind of made it a point to like try to find everything she wrote and follow it and I still didn't kind of understand it because I was a kid, right? I was like what 26 or something. And um and but then I started following her work and I started understanding it. And then she wrote this book called Cunning of Recognition, which I think is one of a really important book for understanding liberal democracies, settler colonialism, global capitalism, and the expectation that we present as pure subjects to the world, or to the courts. And so she was an intellectual role model from afar. And then, of course, like, I was lucky, not of course, I was lucky that when we were in the, um, at McGill together, there was Teresa McCarthy, who was also training. She was at McMaster at the time. We used to, email just started. We used to send each other emails. And um, she was at the same point as I was. We were going through some of the same stuff with our training. So we kind of rose each other up together. And then there was Dawn Martin Hill, who was doing her, also from Six Nations, doing her work with the Lubicon Cree. But she started Indigenous Studies at McMaster as a graduate student when she was, you know, that's amazing. Like, and of course an Indigenous woman does this. She's like, goes and does her field work and starts a, a, a Native Studies program. Like, oh, of course, right? <laughs> so, um, so those are kind of my, my heroes. And then I also, well, not my heroes, people I looked up to, and then also people I like, tried to come through with. And I used to like talking to you too, Eldon. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah there's lots of, uh, lots of nice coffee houses around the gill, and you could uh, go and have, spend hours there. <laughs> Uh, but now you're you're uh, an academic, you know. You're you've got a, a career going, and you're on faculty in the Department of Anthropology at, at Columbia University. Yeah. Uh, where arguably modern anthropology uh, took form. Mm -hmm. none, other, none other than Franz Boas was uh, the founder, or perhaps he was on faculty. You know, he was on faculty. I don't know if he was the founder. He said he's Papa Franz. He Papa. founded oh. it. <laughs> oh, okay. He founded it. Well, tell us about Papa Franz. You know. Like, <laughs> Tell us about Columbia University, I mean, especially about Columbia University I mean, coming, taking a name from the land of Columbus. Oh, you had to bring and, that up. And here we are. Well, well, I'm here still we recovering are. from the <laughs> mo monuments. Uh. Here we are speaking about the land of Columbus in the land of Columbus occupied by the British, you know. So what that kind of symbolism does that uh, bring to you, and how, how does that inform your scholarly perspective? All right, Eldon. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, you know, to be indigenous and self-aware is to be constantly like under whatever, to be constantly assaulted by the signs and symbols of so-called conquest. So there's that. And that's uh, Colombia uh, is, Colombia, so Colombia, I'm just gonna try to divorce it from the legacy of Columbus if that's possible. But um, Colombia is a pretty awesome place in that it is, number one, indeed the birthplace, so-called birthplace of American anthropology. And uh, Papa Franz, do we have a relief of him in the, in the lounge? He was the founder. And I know Boaz has, his, has been through these areas. And um, however, we're, the people in place in that department are, uh, some of them would, would, would have studied Boaz, of course, but we are a particular, uh, fun it's like Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch, <laughs> in a good way. We are not, we are, for us, our baseline is colonialism. So there's none of this like salvage, fetishize, like hmm, maybe there's a moment. I've seen a few moments where I'm like, hmm, that's unusual. What are you doing with my colleagues? But we all like, are very interested in critical projects, right? So, however, you know, so they know what I'm up to because they're up to similar things. Now, I've, I have been in another department that was, uh, I was at Cornell, that was a bit different. Um, but I think it's, a, it's interesting that it's Franz Boaz's department and yet we're not interested in salvaging, we don't think native people are disappearing. Native people are in the room. Right, native people are teaching the course. I'm, t you know, so it's a it's a different kind of space, right? So I'd say it's a it's a hot house of critical and political anthropology, rather than a a site of salvage and anxiety about the disappearing savage. Well, I have a piece on Boaz. It's called "Why White People Love Friends Boaz." Oh, yeah. where, where did you get that published? <laughs> yeah, I'll email it to you. Thank Everyone, you. thank you. That'll we'll be, do the list serve. Be good. Uh, but at the same time as uh, Franz Boaz is there, uh, he's also teaching some very famous yes. anthropologists. And there's some alumna who are famous, like Margaret Mead and, yes. and Ruth Benedict, who are both giants in yes. modern anthropology still. Yes. Uh, they studied there in, in post-World War I yes. and, and before the Depression. So in the century that has lapsed, and when you look back personally, how does your experience in an, as an anthropologist compare with female academics of that era? Mm. I mean, they were feminists before the, the movement went mainstream. And how are, they, how are they regarded in contemporary feminist anthropology? Oh, I think they're celebrated. You know, they were lovers, which is cute. I always like to bring that up. The, the Barnard students perk up. Um, you know, the people I think to, to really, I prefer to, pref, prefer to compare myself, because those were upper class white women. You know, and I, that's not my uh, space. Um, but Ella Deloria, you know, was, got her degree from Teachers College. She worked very closely with Franz Boaz in preparation for our conversation. I was reading Bo, um, Ella Deloria again, and you know, her, her Dakota texts, which is masterful and will give you nightmares. I mean, the stories, the beautiful, haunting stories that she collected from her territories, that book is inscribed for Franz Boas, oh, yeah. right? And, and then Zora Neale Hurston, who's one of the most important, I think, anthropologists of, of that century, um, collected all this work, worked with her own people, um, was writing in a way that is still beautiful today. Um, you know, she died broke in a hotel. She was in a hotel. She was cleaning hotels. Ella Deloria was living in a car at one point, right? And she was dependent on Franz Boas to send her money so that she could continue her research. And she was always... Uh, I would just reread Vine Deloria. You know, this is the Deloria family, right? Deloria, Vine, Vine is probably one of the most important political thinkers of our time. And his auntie was Ella Deloria. And he critiqued anthropology so vigorously that he's part of the reason why there is actually a method state, a methods uh, code, of, code of ethics that comes into place in, I think, 1970 or 71. There are people here who will know this better than I. 
Um, so I, I always imagined, and some people have written about it in this way, that the way Ella Deloria suffered to do her work with Boaz informed Vine Deloria's critique of anthropology because he saw what happened to his auntie. So, but at the same time, Ella Deloria, as all of us here, indigenous peoples, will tell you, she was a good relative. And she, um, you know, could not, like these non-indigenous, some like Ruth Benedict or Margaret Mead, like ignore her family <laughs> to go live in New York City. She basically had her sister with her all the time. They lived together. She was always going back home to take care of people because as when her dad died, she had to take care of the family. So I feel more like that's a comparable point. Now, I get to sometimes opt out of my family obligations. Uh, it's it, not without incredible guilt. <laughs> so um, I think about those women when I think about my place in the field, and also, I'm also childless, right? Which, there was no way I could have done what I did, working 60 to 80 hours a week on the tenure track and have a kid. I was killing plants at one point. <laughs> and I was like, this is not, you know, like I need to not have a plant, you know? And so I, you know, I mean, I, so I think there's that kind of thing where, and I think for our people, like that is really for me heartbreaking that I didn't get to have kids. Like I'm, I still like I'm upset about that. But, um, but I had a good book, and I'll have other good books, I hope. And um, I could, you could play with the books too, take care of them, and so it sort of works out in the end. Yeah, and uh, of course, Ella Deloria. Uh, I mean, her uh, book, A Water Lily, wasn't published until 17 yes. years after she died. Yeah, you know, which was. Uh, I always thought, you know, like. Margaret Mead presented her work coming of age in Samoa, which was fiction that she presented as fact. And mm -hmm. I always thought, well, this is like Ella Deloria went the opposite way. She just said, this is all storytelling, and that's how I'm going to present it, yeah. you know, ethnography as storytelling. Yeah. Uh, but also, at the same time, Ella Deloria had another famous niece who was an anthropologist, and that was yeah. Beatrice Medicine. Yeah. And what, uh, how does uh, yeah. Beatrice Medicine, uh, yeah. how does her work influence uh, Native uh, she, academics today? You know, she wasn't one of my immediate her heroes at the time, but she did her, I think it's a 1971 dissertation at University of Wisconsin on drinking and sobriety amongst the Lakota Sioux. And I was like, ooh, she's brave. <laughs> so I always thought that about her. And I, um, you know, I wasn't as close with her. I don't know if it's because she's in the States. I met her one time, and then she sent me fabulous postcards of, um, Kalua Martini. I don't know if she could read my inner soul or something, but <laughs> she sent that to me. So she was sweet. I mean, she was kind to me, but I wasn't close to her intellectually. And that book she did, which I know you reviewed. Uh, Learning to be an anthropologist and remaining native. Yeah, I didn't read it. So, so I wish I could speak to it, but I, I didn't read it. I... Oh, I have to. I have to say, you know, Beatrice Medicine was somebody who was very influential in my own life. You mm. know, uh, she was a visiting professor at the University of Calgary when I was an undergrad there, and a few times, you know, when she had to go off to conferences, she would ask me to to guest speak, guest lecture in her courses, mm. uh, and in uh, return. She got me a fellowship at the Smithsonian Institution. Well, Eldon. <laughs> Look at you. I was just like, Gail took me to dinner. <laughs> like, you went to the Smithsonian. <laughs> I was like so touched by my lunches. <laughs> so who are the, who, uh, other than yourself, who can you think of uh, who are uh, anthropologists today who are practicing and who are making a, a, an impact on the discipline who are also native and... Oh, indigenous. Oh, I love, I think Teresa McCarthy wrote a really good ethnography and it's won an award from Native American Indigenous Studies Association in Divided Unity um, on the reclamation at Caledonia. Very careful, I mean, very careful, elegant study of conflict supposed conflict and her people's attempt to educate settlers on our culture. So I'm very inspired by that book. And, um, um, but I'm also excited about ethnography again. Like I, I, I'm really also, another thing is Eldon, like I also am hardcore native studies. I had to start doing native studies um, when I moved to the States. And so to me, anthropology and native studies are, are starting to really speak to each other in nice ways. Mm -hmm. And I think my book is, it can 
exemplifies some of that. Teresa's book exemplifies some of that. We're reading with each other now, as opposed to being in um, opposition. So that's something I, I'll say, and you know, people can ask me about that if they want, or it's just, I think that's something really nice about anthropology now, is it's it, like the tent is getting bigger, and you know, it's, it's more, uh, I mean, it's been attacked, I think, so vigorously, and it, it, it really is a changed space, I think, in terms of the writing. So I'm really excited about Teresa's book, but also beyond Teresa, I think there's some excellent women anthropologists. Amy Meredith Cox, an African-American anthropologist, did a beautiful study, Shape Shifters on Black Girls in, um, in Shelters, that is just beautiful. Like, it's not about being desperate and lonely, and, 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 but it's a very dignified account of like helping your family out and opting to live in a shelter and also make life in that in those spaces. Also, my colleague Cassie fin Catherine Fennell has written a great book also on um, infrastructure of all things. She made it an interesting, beautiful study on um, the projects in Chicago. So I'm really excited about ethnography uh, again and the way these younger women are writing is just awesome. And then of course there's, you know, there are um, other studies uh, I think in Canada that have, have you know, you can't, like Dara Colhane, Julie Cruikshank, like these are sturdy, beautiful models of engaged collaborative work, right, that I think were bright spots when there wasn't much that was bright, right? Very bright. Okay, well, thank you very much for your conversation, Yona. I've been asking you these uh, uh, questions, but now I'd like to turn it over to the audience and see if there are any, anybody uh, who has any questions and uh, Posed to Audra, now's your chance. You're very, you're very quiet. Well, we got our first question here. Thanks. Um, yeah, I wasn't planning on asking the. I'm, I was sure there was going to be somebody else. Um, but I, can I? First of all, I'm a huge uh, admirer of your of your work and um, the the presentation that you had given on uh, Chief Therese Spence um, in Edmonton at a conference was really one of the uh, academic high points in terms of conference going experiences for me. It was a brilliantly uh, powerfully delivered uh, message uh, that, that really has resonated with me. So thank you so much. I never had an opportunity to thank you at that time. Um, but I'm, I'm curious because you talked about being in school and reading this uh, sort of anti-colonial uh, account of, of uh, Africa. And I'm just curious if you can speak a little bit more about that and, and where that resonated for you. Was it a kind of... Yeah you know, an intellectual moment, or was it a, at an emotional level yeah. that you kind of recognized this common ground? Yeah, thanks so much. That's a great question, and thank you for your thanks. Um, it was, I think it was Archie Mafiji, The Ideology of Tribalism. I hope I have this right, and if I don't, forgive me. Um, it resonated intellectually, because he linked this idea of, if I remember correctly from a, too long ago, um, the, the conceptualization of African polities as only tribal, as opposed to like deeper political orders. And he wasn't using that language, but it, and, but it was an indictment of this language of tribalism. And the way that it spoke to me was I was like always hearing at home, we're a nation, like we're not a whatever, this other, and you know, American, so-called American Indians will say, what tribe are you? You know, like, cause it's like tribal, like they use that language, like tribe instead of nation. And so it really just spoke to me as this is a kind of, this is where it comes from actually, this, I, this idea, ideology, like a belief system that is politicized and is doing a kind of work. Um, that really kind of, a light bulb went off and I was like, you can do this in anthropology? Like you can, and then, oh my God, there's all the whole, the Talal Assad, right? There was, he was doing all this important work and still is doing this important work on like 
the relationship between colonial, coloniality and governance and, and knowledge. So those were just incredibly powerful works for me. And reading Orientalism was another like, oh my God, <laughs> this, is, this is how it can be, right? And, and um, so that's what I will say. It, it was deeply intellectual. Um, and sometimes things that are deeply intellectual, I don't know about you, but for me, it can be really affective and exciting and I get into it, and then I, but it really just kind of gave me hope for anthropology. And, and at McGill, we were not required to read Foucault, we were not required to read, like I'm still kind of mad about my training there, like, cause I had to be self-taught, right? So, you know, I did a whole, uh, one of my essay, my comprehensive essays I wrote was on um, discourse and narrativity and I forced myself to read Archaeology of Knowledge, right? I still don't know what that book is, but I made myself read it, you know? And um, I did a whole, th I did a thing on, uh, of course, the Haudenosaunee, but a particular way. Like, so, I mean, and I, I'm being a little whiny, but I look at these folks that I now, like, see their files, you know, when I'm reading for fellowships or whatever, the ones that come out of Chicago and da da, -da they're like, they're reading their Hegel, they're reading their Bagel, they're reading their Kegel, you know, they're like, they're like, so I was at a disadvantage. I had to catch up with, I have to catch, I'm still catching up with those peeps, right? So, um, yeah, I went off on a tangent, but you know what I mean. Hi, um, thank you very much for the discussion, very interesting. Uh, when I was listening to the discussion, the issue about the United States Constitution came up, mm -hmm. and I was always really curious about that myself, and um, did a little bit of research on it, and I, I, I believe the word caucus is an indigenous word, um, but that needs to be researched a bit more. But the thing, the question I had was, you know, there's that knowledge about the possibility that the United States um, followed that model. Mm -hmm. um, as an indigenous Mohawk person, how do you feel about that? Like, I know in talking to other people, they had very mixed feelings about it. And the, the other thing I heard was on top of the Capitol building, the, the statue on the very top, is a Mohawk warrior, but I'm not sure about that. Oh, we'll have to we'll have to Google that later. I don't know about that, um, but I'll look in. Well, we'll all look into it, I guess. Um, so, how I feel about the the whole debate over the Constitution is, I don't think it's not a debate for me. Um, I don't have a problem with the idea of them copying something that works so well. If they, in fact, were imitating us or copying it, they obviously didn't do it in our form because they don't require unanimity, and we need unanimity amongst our chiefs. So, but it was an attempt at a kind of democratic process that I think is very Haudenosaunee, and um, the Americans with the electoral college system and their business with voting for people who vote for you or change their mind is uh, very far from where we actually are. But in our governance system. But my point is with um, that I was talking about with Eldon also is at that time, the new, it's, I forget the years if it was, you'll have to forgive me because I can't remember the precise time frame. New York State had um, requirements that uh, Iroquois be on the state curriculum. And our people in New York State had um, put this forward to be put in the curriculum, right? That, New York State, for one year, the kids would learn uh, indigenous history, Iroquois history in particular, and that they learn this about the Constitution. These anthropologists went and testified against us in this case, right? So that, and his, some historians. And um, they also did some really ugly stuff to people within the, prof within the field, these, uh, in particular, these two white women who were one, do, did wonderful work with our people uh, in um, upstate New York at a, pla um, at a place called Ganyage, one of them, Gail Landsman, they pretty much blackballed these anthropologists for presumably being sympathetic to us. So there was all this like kind of ugliness also behind the scenes that um, made us shut down to anthropology. So, um, so anyway, that constitutional debate is one of the issues that we had with them. 
And there's pretty, there's a good article on, in Amer Journal of American Folklore, I think, where, um, I think it's in my book, I think I cited in the book, where some of our chiefs talk about this very explicitly. So there's documentation, which I appreciate. It's fact. <laughs> it's not just me running my mouth. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so my question is, uh, you use the word accomplice instead of ally, and yeah. I assume that's on purpose, and I'm wondering if you could unpack that a little bit for us. I don't know. There's a little literature on it now. You should look to Joss Dillon and Siku Alulu, who are writing through this. The way I understand it is it's like, uh, it's not just ally, it's, it's like somebody who's going to go to the mat with you um, and is willing to do crime with you. I mean, they might have a different, because accomplices... Right, it's got that uh, oh, on the dark side. <laughs> Next level. Okay, um, hi, I'm um, actually from Germany and I last year um, went to Quebec for the first time and so yeah, it's really cool to um, yeah, meet you today. And I was so um, shocked honestly to hear so many um, Quebecois people, although I'm like, my personality didn't like allow me to judge really. I was so shocked to hear like French Quebecois people talk about how they've been colonialized by the British. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, whoa, like how can you use that vocabulary? I, I don't, don't know, understand. And like, I don't know, I was just speechless. And then, um, and those were all like universally educated people I was mm -hmm. talking to. Um, Anyway, so I was just wondering if you were, um, yeah, willing to speak to that. Like, how do mm -hmm. you, how how often mm -hmm. do you face these discussions um, around in Montreal, or wherever? And like, how do you respond to these comments, or do you ever get them any even? Like, because I, I was just like, no, like, <laughs> we can't talk about it like that. Like, these people have just been like colonialism in that sense is like. So wrong to yeah, be used. Uh, I don't know. They were yeah. denigrated. I mean, they were. Yeah. They have a, a really important history. Like Hubert Guindon has written about it. Of course, Pierre Vallier is the one of their seminal thinkers in terms of liberation, their liberation theology or revolutionary thinkers. But they do. Ha there are sociologists who have written about the terrible way they were treated by Anglo Quebecers. Right. The. Um, they were discouraged from speaking their language. There was the whole, front, you know, Catholic uh, hegemony in that in that area for years, and um, so they were definitely. I mean, I will give. I they were denigrated for being different, for speaking a language improperly. It was thought of. Um, whether or not that is colonial or whether or not they had a right to adopt the language of nigritude is really um, hard for me to make a call on. I'll say um, Bruno Cornelier is doing really good work on this. He's um, a lit scholar at University of Winnipeg. He's written on the particular readings <laughs> of Vallier. Um, but I, can't, I do not feel comfortable telling anybody they haven't been colonized. Um, but I do feel comfortable saying in terms of the space they're sharing, they're not, they're on our land. <laughs> I'll tell them that. <laughs> that to me is like less, uh, less up for debate. Thank you so much for everything you've shared today. I really appreciate it. I had the opportunity to see you at University of Toronto a couple of years ago, and it uh, changed my mind on the field, so I ended up doing my graduate work in anthropology. So thank you for that as well. Oh, um, my God. <laughs> I, just, I can't believe I worked as a recruiter for anthropology. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I, I respect so many of the anthropologists in the room, so I hope they... Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, thank, I come from uh, my background was in gender studies, so it's oh. a bit of a diversion. Um, but part of what I was curious about in terms of this theme of intellectual traditions in the field, right. I think one of the things that there continues to be pretty vibrant debates on is uh, how do we write the stories of anthropology and who do we write them for? 
And one of the crit comments that I've received in the past is, are we writing for each other as scholars or are mm. we writing for our, our participants and interlocutors? And I mm. think that one of the things that I found in my own work and, um, and I'm still trying to figure out where I stand in relation to this is that there can be a tendency, I feel, especially when we're doing um, work with vulnerable populations, mm -hmm. the need to make sure that the stories that we tell are told in a way that's accessible to them, that, mm -hmm. so that we're not writing in the grand traditions of Foucault. Mm -hmm. But similarly, there's also a pressure, I find, at some points, to fit ourselves into an intellectual tradition of what it means to write scholarship, and mm -hmm. particularly what it meets, needs to write anthropological scholarship. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you can talk to that seeming discontinuity and, and who we how we are accountable to each other in the field and predominantly to our interlocutors. Right. I think we should all, I, well, we are, anthropology, God bless us, we are not, no longer able to pretend like we know everything, that they don't read, they don't read what we write, that we're not accountable, that we don't care, that we're detached, and I think, ever since at least, I mean, some people hold up actually Benedict and Mead and actually in particular ways, they always ignore Zora Neale Hurston and of course Ella Deloria, but um, you know, Zora was writing also for her people, you can tell. I mean, when I, when I teach her work, it's like people in the room light up. They do not light up when I teach uh, EP. Evans, E-E-P, Evans Pritchard, E-E-P, whatever. You know, they're like, fucking bring on the smelling salts, right? <laughs> now, um, it's like there are no newer in there. It's kit segmentary lineage. Like, that is not speaking, like, I wonder, I mean, but then at the same time, you know, some of that work can be really useful. I look at some of the linguistic stuff now, it's like, People are actually re reworking their languages with the older linguistics material. So as much as I critique that stuff for its like lifelessness at times, it can do a lot of work with um, resurgence, right? Cultural resurgence. So with that being said, I have no one model. I mean, I think when you're trying to get tenure, when you're on the hustle, when you're like, you've got to write a book that will get published and that, you know, there are constraints around your discourse also, but there are all these awesome models of possibilities, right? So you have dialogic anthropology, you know, Julie Cruikshank blew that up for us. Um, you have more analytical models, you have, um, you know, uh, of course, Zora, which is, you know, uh, Hurston's work, which I think I see shades of that in Amy Cox's work, the way she's listening to people. Um, so I think there are many different models. And again, there's the neoliberal constraint, there's the tenure clock, there's your own desires, perhaps, for a kind of move, not you, but some of us here in our secret moments, oh, I want the white boys to love me. <laughs> I'm good, you know, I want them to think I'm a proper Foucauldian, you know, like you, some of you might have those moments. And that can constrain your discourse. Or it can open you up to that readership, you know, and then you get to go to their conferences. <laughs> I'm not saying that's you. I'm just saying some of us, you know, in our secret worlds, like where we want to be read. I wanted to be read by my own people. I was like, can my, can my parents read this? And my first book launch was at home. Oh my God, Ganawaga came out. It was so beautiful. <laughs> and, and um, you know, people read the book and, and, and my dad said, well, I enjoyed the first 10 pages. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a failure. But, you know, he, he tried. But they're, they're so cute. You know, they took the cover of the book and um, for, at, in Ganawaga, they made big posters, right? So my dad took it and he framed it. <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> Thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience. I'm glad you mentioned about Professor Ali Mafeji and this Guguwa uh, Tiongo and so on. From I, I'm from Tanzania, so oh. he was teaching in the University of Dar es Salaam. So I remember that very well. Oh. So I, I'm glad you bring up. Now my question is about, you know, recently there has been discussion about uh, multiculturalism in relation to indigenous people. And there is a 
suggestion that we should look by nationalism in terms of indigenous people and, and, and immigrants. I don't know, there's a guy, I've forgotten his name, he has written a paper about it. And so I was wondering, what do you think of uh, multiculturalism in terms of uh, reconciliation and immigrant versus indigenous debate? And, uh, and second question I probably have is about grandparents' role in, in transmitting anthropological knowledge to grandchildren. Okay, so small issues. Yeah. So, <laughs> so st I think st myself, you know, state-driven projects to reconcile are impossible. And um, impossible and we should really think critically about it and try to use their money to do better things. Because um, they're throwing all kinds of money around now, right? Am I wrong or right? Indigenization and can you the million jobs and you know the, another neoliberal five-year plan. Um, multiculturalism has been going on for a while, right? And I think it's also I'm not totally and I'm not going to use the language of comfort, but I think it's also in some ways depoliticizing landscapes that are political. So when we think about immigrant rights on stolen land, things change, right? Um, the political legitimacies that should be welcoming these folks to these territories are, are not US border could, could, patrol, or whatever. Um, so I think it's an inherently, I think Harsha Wali has done good work on this. Um, but there's a lot more to be done too in terms of reimagining and repracticing our relations with each other as opposed to with the state. And that's all I can say about it. And I don't know how to imagine that in a nuts and bolts way yet, but I'm sure somebody else here does and is actually doing that work. Um, and then what did you say about transmitting an anthropological knowledge or ancestral knowledge? Both. Ancestral knowledge. And transmitting it? What about it? No, in terms of because there is so much influence of other cultures coming in, mm -hmm. including internet. Oh, the internet. Trying to, 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 to interfere with the transmission of. Well, I say let's use the internet to transmit that knowledge. So I, maybe it's not so much a, a, a pollutant as it, it can be a, a mechanism for transmission also. And, um, it's wonderful that knowledge is being reproduced from elders to youth, but it's also reproducing laterally also. Is that lateral, vertical, whatever, this side to side also. So um, I know some pretty young elders. So I think knowledge comes from many different people. And yeah, I'll leave it at that. Hi there. Um, my question is on your current work. You said you're writing, um, working on emotional history yeah. of the state yeah. and inspired by the Oka events. Can you speak to me like what, elucidate what is an emotional history? Why is it important to look at history from an emotional standpoint? Yeah, well, first of all, the emotions crew doesn't look at history so much, but they do look at the emotions. And those emotions are being produced with structures and with uh, political economic arrangements. And um, my theory is that there's a new force in town and it's the force of emotion. It's no longer acceptable to beat us up and to kill us, but they can love us now and they can express sorrow and they can pretend like they care for us while doing heinous things to our land and to uh, at times our bodies. So I think emotions are actually, and in particular kinds of emotions, the emotions of care, of contrition, of saying I'm sorry and not really meaning it. Um, these performatives and these practices, I think, allow for uh, extraction. So that's what I'm working with now. That's what I'm writing through now. And um, I consider it a subaltern history because I interview people who are critical of reconciliation. And they're, they're largely subaltern because we can't critique it. It's not allowed, you know, it's almost like not allowed. You're being a bad person. So I interviewed the bad people. I'm joking. I interviewed the critics. And it's helping me to track this out. So 
That's it. It's called savage states. Because the state is savage, we're not. We could be done now, right? Oh, no. <laughs> the woman in sequence. You should have gone first. Hi. Um, you know, I wonder what do you see us developing when one wants to depart from nationhood, yeah. from that paradigm, and yeah. you know, going to tribes or like, what is that you see in the future coming? Because I couldn't be more agreeable. Yeah, I do. You don't. know, to get away from those ways of power, yeah, right? Yeah, that is serving the people. Yeah. The white people in power forever. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't know how to think. I try to imagine it, you know. I saw Black Panther 2. I was hoping, I was like, where do we find it? You know, where do we find outside the nation state? And I, I you know, do we, do we turn away entirely from the form and just recreate political orders ourselves and self-governing orders ourselves? Like these people that are off the grid, they have to be off the grid in Puerto Rico right now, right? But, I, but they're also doing incredible stuff to take care of each other, right, in this time of crisis. Um, outside of the state, because the states failed them. So um, I don't know, I don't have the answer, but I think we all have to think energetically and imaginatively and, and in practice. And again, I like this language of relationality um, and imagine ourselves as good, good relations to each other, like as opposed to these deeply autonomous and individualized, indifferent uh, m people. Like, I like Ella's work and El thinking about Ella Deloria because she could never turn away from her family and it cost her, but imagine if we all thought like that and we imagined ourselves to be that way with each other. You know, it would be, it would be a, a, a regime of responsibility <laughs> and obligation and possibly care, or non-care. I mean, I, I think we can also have spaces to, for, for that kind of a productive antagonism. You don't have to like all your cousins, right? But um, I, tr I do, <laughs> so I really do. So I mean, but if we, if we imagine ourselves that way, different, it, it could be quite different, I think. But we'll see. Yeah, one more, right? Can we start putting yes. a cap yes. on it? Or? Yes, I would suggest one more question. Yeah, there's one more in the back. I'm not an anthropologist, but I have a question about the Mohawk people being a matrilineal um, order where the, um, the children get the names of the mother and that women are also part of the government mm -hmm. of the Mohawk people, which is very interesting structural that may be different than um, other people. And I just wondered if you can talk a little bit about that. I talked about it a lot in the book. Um, it's the it's the one of the things that people find remarkable about us, but also is one of the things that things I shouldn't say things. It's one of the structures that is most damaged and challenged by the Indian Act. So you know, the Indian Act instantiates a heteropatriarchal model of descent. Uh, it created it completely. In, in empowering men the way it did and in, in instantiating an electoral system of governance, it completely challenged the power of indigenous, of Mohawk women, of Haudenosaunee women, and attempted to dismantle our governance systems. Now it also does this everywhere else though, because it's dismantling traditional governance systems. So it's regendering all of us. Um, as far as I know, there is not in our uh, history, in our community, uh, I, and I don't believe this though, because trees fall in the forest whether or not we see them, but there isn't um, a history of queerness that's documented. But we do have, of course, LGBTQ in our communities. But the Indian Act also tries to produce straightness and value straightness. So it really is a, a, a kind of gender nightmare, a governance and gender nightmare, um, an instrument of settler colonialism that is trying to disappear our governance system, which I think is as bad as trying to kill our bodies. So, um, 
So that's what I will say about it. And that was the struggle that I document. That produces the struggle in my community around membership. Um, because our land is taken, um, our women can no longer marry whoever we want, um, and we bring in what we think is an answer at one point, which is blood quantum, because it seems neutral. 50% blood quantum. So that set up all sorts of hell for us. Um, and yet to some really seemed like a good idea because 50%, if you're more, then you're you know, clearly Indian. If you're less, then you're clearly not. To some people. And yet for others, this is antithetical to our way of doing things. It's who your mother, your mother's clan. That's how you're who your mother is. So, and you get your property from your mother. We divorce our men by putting their belongings outside the longhouse. It's that simple, you know? Uh, and that all changes in, I think it's 1884 for us, or 87, I think it comes into our community. So that's what I will say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. acknowledging you in a, with an honor song. And I'd like to ask my colleagues to come up and we'd like to thank you both for this evening. And I'm going to invite you to come down onto the uh, common ground. Okay. And, um, and, and I'm going to invite Richard and uh, Ron uh, to come and help me. And also June. Too many things in my hands, my apologies. So we have a bit of work to do here, and we'd like to ask you to witness uh, what we're doing here for the community here at SFU, uh, specifically the Indigenous Research Institute. Um, so we'd like to, to do a little bit of work, and we're just asking you to bear witness what you see, hear, and feel in your heart from this evening and also what we're going to present. So I'm just going to give this one here. <laughs> So first of all, uh, forgive us, Audra, we're going to thank June, who was your predecessor in the lecture prior to this evening. Uh, we also hosted June's lecture, and we'd like to thank her for her scholarship and her courageous insights that she brought as a Métis scholar and a First Nations scholar. So we're going to thank her publicly uh, for that today. Yes. <laughs> And, um, and this is um, also our thank you to you, Audra. This is um, our um, understanding that we are honoring you with a gift, but in the tradition of, the, uh, of us, some of us wear these um, beautiful Northwest Coast uh, garments. And uh, so we're honoring you in a way, yes. Uh, and so... <laughs> and, um, 
I have this from Debbie, who was a el the elder. She thought this was really to be yours. Oh my God. So Thank that's you, uh, <laughs> the I elder. Was yeah, I thought so. <laughs> and I kept on wanting to put it on you today because oh it matches your outfit, and you yes. looked you looked like you needed it With this evening. Clothes. Yes, I know. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, so we wanted to, uh, in our own humble way, um, blanket you with a, a Northwest Coast garment. Um, yes, so thank you. And we'd like to raise our hands to her and thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> so we have a, a little bit of business to do. Um, and we, so this is an important event for us also because we wanted to, um, here in a public way, um, invite Eldon to step before us. We'd like to stand Eldon up today. We'd like to honor him as the past director of the First Nations Research Institute and thank him for all his very hard work as the first founder of our uh, group here. June, do you want to just... Pin him here. And so we're standing him up as a, one of our elder scholars at the Simon Fraser University and also someone who has shaped um, the possibilities for Indigenous scholars in our community. And so today we are raising our hands to him as our past director and also important scholar in our Indigenous scholarly community at SFU. And so we'd like you to invite you to uh, honor him as well. And this is a gift from the Institute uh, for you, Eldon, and thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, Michael. And on the behalf of First Nation Studies at SFU, I just want to thank Eldon um, for being so humble. Um, so generous, and I love just hanging out with Eldon because he has the best stories. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Eldon. So I'm just going to invite you to stand up. Okay. And, uh, we're going to just uh, do a little, a uh, little bit lighter music, a little bit more in the tradition of, of more of a round dance tradition, and I'm just going to invite you to tell me. 